morning and good evening to those of you joining us from Seoul. My name is Jisoo Kim. I'm the director of the GW Institute for Korean Studies and Korea Foundation Associate Professor of History, International Affairs and East Asian Languages and Literatures. I would like to welcome you all to our book launch event, the book Rights Claiming in South Korea. Uh, this book is, uh, well, you know, as it is with you know, book launch event. Uh, this is, we'll be promoting our book. <laughs> this book is uh, available online uh, uh, for sale right now, but ebook will be available in May and printed version will be available in June. Uh, we have shared the 20% discount code in our announcement. So um, uh, you can, no, in, in our chat box. So uh, if you're interested in purchasing the book, um, uh, you can use the 20% discount code. It is up. Uh, pretty pricey because it will be um, hard copy uh, when it's going to be available in June. So um, as one of the contributors of this book, I would like to especially thank our editors, co-editors, Celeste Arrington and Pat Patricia uh, Getty for all their hard work in publishing this book. This edited volume was based on the signature conference um, that Jewish hosted in April, 2018. And I would also like to thank the contributors of this book and the two commentators who are able to join us today. Um, just to uh, let you know, uh, uh, many of our contributors, uh, nine of them joined us uh, right now, but I, uh, there may be a few more contributors joining um, uh, at this uh, event today. So, well, let me, before we begin, let me uh, get into the discussions. Let me briefly introduce our speakers. In order to save more time for q and I will just uh, briefly mention their title. So for their longer bios, please refer to our program. So our first, our co-editors, Celeste Arrington, she is Korea Foundation Associate Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at the George Washington University. And uh, Patricia Getty um, is a professor at Sung Kyung Wan University School of Law, where she was also appointed Associate Dean of Academic Affairs affairs from 2016 to 18. And I would also like to thank our two discussants for joining us today, Heyun Chu, who is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Toronto, and uh, Paul Chang, who is an associate professor of sociology at Harvard University, and he serves as a director of undergraduate studies in the Department of Sociology and the director of undergraduate student programs at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. So um, our co-editors will first introduce the book, and then discussants will uh, uh, give comments Comments. And then uh, uh, our one of our contributors, Erin uh, Chung, who is the uh, Charles D. Miller Associate Professor of East Asian Politics in the Department of Political Science at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, will be uh, making brief comments and then we'll open up for Q&A. So our co-editors will lead the Q&A session. So without further ado, um, Celeste and uh, Patty, take it over. Thank you very much, Jisoo. Um, and I want to start by uh, first thanking GWIX and um, saying that this book would not have been possible without the support of GWIX and its director, Jisoo, um, as well as funding from the Association for Korean Studies. And most importantly, I could not have asked for a better co-editor than Patricia. So thank you very much for all of your hard work over the last three years. And to our contributors, we really have a dream team, if you will, of um, on time and thoughtful and um, responsive contributors to this volume. So, and as far as edited volumes go from the editor's perspective, it's really been a pleasure to work with all of you. And I hope today's discussion will give you a sense of just how vibrant um, the intellectual exchange and the friendships have been th that we've developed through this book. So also I wanna thank everyone for working hard during this unexpected upheaval that we've faced with the global pandemic. Um, it has not delayed the book at all. Um, and so I really appreciate all of your hard work. And today, especially thank you for our discussants, um, Heon and Paul for joining us to think about this book as a whole now, um, since we began a number of years ago with each individual paper. Um, so I'm going to share a couple of slides just to illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, so to briefly I'll begin, I will summarize the book's approach. Um, so in this book, we investigate how rights are understood, enacted, and challenged in South Korea. In short, we examine rights in action. 
And our core questions that we um, raised at the beginning of the book project were the following five ones. How do different groups interpret and mobilize rights? What factors or reforms have affected the perceived efficacy of different rights claiming channels and the likelihood that groups will engage in rights claiming? Third, what sources of support do rights claimants have in terms of advocacy groups, legal assistance, and funding? And fourth, are there any collisions among rights claims or tensions among rights claims? And finally, do some rights discourses, whether unintentionally or intentionally, privilege some groups of people over others? In the past few decades, rights claims have really proliferated in South Korea, and our chapters illustrate how rights claiming targets not just the state, but also businesses and other societal actors. And the book reveals, I think, really interesting learning among rights claimants in South Korea. The chapters also trace how different groups engage with international rights discourses and mechanisms, including UN bodies and international treaties. Um, so before I turn it over to Patty uh, to uh, give you an overview of the book's structure, I want to clarify how we define rights. We use a very broad definition of rights in this book, including but not limited to constitutional rights, human rights, substantive and procedural rights, um, civil, political, social, economic, and cultural rights, women's rights, um, citizens' rights, minority rights. And all of these rights concepts, as you'll see from chapters as we discuss them, do not necessarily mean the same thing across time and place. The historical experiences and social interactions that we um, document in this book show how certain rights are imbued with distinctive meanings and overtone, overtones. However, we believe um, that rights are not completely subjective and historically or socially constructed, but rather rights are grounded in similar baseline notions about human worth and dignity, about the legal protections that the state gives, and also restraints on state actions. And we also think that uh, rights are grounded in similar baseline notions about the utility of claiming some legal entitlement. We investigate through the chapters in this book what people mean when they invoke rights language or bring claims in Korea. And we also tra track the backlash or counter mobilization against um, certain rights and how these can reconfigure the conception of rights that, that groups hold. In short, the mechanisms and the iterative processes of claims making are really how rights become legible. And so now I'll turn it over to um, Patty to give us an overview of the book's structure. Great, thank you, Celeste. So first of all, I'd like to I'd like to echo everything Celeste has said about this being um, a really fun, productive, uh, and friendly process. Um, we've had a terrific group, a terrific team of contributors, and um, this has resulted in. Um, really uh, a really cohesive organization to the book. We've, uh, we've asked for um, an interdisciplinary approach. So we've, we've brought in um, some, some fantastic scholars um, in the fields of political science, law, sociology, history, um, geography, gender studies, um, and, I, and I hope I'm not missing, <laughs> missing anybody in, in this list, but I do wanna also um, stress that we have uh, activists and practitioners um, who, who have really been involved on the ground. And so really we have um, many, many top voices um, giving us really the, the state of the field in this, in this volume. So what I'd like to do is, um, I'll, I'll start talking about um, these, these different sections. Just very quickly, part one is rights in historical perspective. Part two is institutional mechanisms and support structures for rights claiming. Part three is mobilizing rights for and by marginalized people. And part four is shaping rights for new citizens and non-citizens. So um, Celeste and I'll, I'll alternate um, 
summarizing these parts. And we can definitely go into more detail, I think, during discussion and Q&A. But for um, part one, to start off with, we thought it would be a good idea to, to start with a historical perspective on, on rights. And here we serendipitously ended up with um, chapters regarding women. And so we titled this Bringing Women Back In, um, really to contest the notion that uh, women, women, about women's legal capacity um, in the past. And so we find here that these three chapters basically examine the legal capacity of women to, or how the legal capacity of women to bring claims to the state varied under the different governing structures of the time. So these would be women as being subjects of a kingdom, then to colonial subjects, and then finally to rights bearing citizens in a newly established democratic nation. It's important to remember that the Korean use of the word rights or quality did not begin until the late 1800s, but, the Kore but Koreans used the language of law and justice in, in seeking uh, remedies to their grievances in, um, and especially by bringing petitions to, to Choson rulers. So we have from Chisu um, uh, a story about Joseon era women using petitions based on actually Neo-Confucian principles to try to rectify injustices um, even before the concept of private individual rights existed in Korea. And we see how the state allowed these petitions to maintain hierarchical and social and moral order, but also to show that the state had a sense of justice for, for, the, for the nation. Similarly, with uh, Sung Yen's paper, we see that um, Japanese colonial officials permitted as well certain inheritance related legal claims from women, um, again, showing that women did have legal capacity um, and that even in this process, there may have been some contravention of Korean customs, but these claims still help to solidify the Japanese household registry system. So moving on, we see that claims making can be both empowering but restricted by existing laws and social orderings that privilege men above women and yangban or elites over peasants. We see this as family law developed in, in the early statehood of the Republic of Korea. We see that women's rights were subjugated to the higher priorities of stabilizing patriarchal families for the sake of national economic development, but also subordinated more generally to the priority of political rights as well. So overall, this section is really interesting to show how women petitioned and litigated uh, for their rights in relation to the state's priorities. And we'll be able to, to see how that gets teased out in, in, the more contemporary, in the more contemporary era as well. Okay, so Celeste will go over section two. Thank you very much, Patty. Um, in section two, we turn to the how, like the institutional mechanisms and the resources for rights claiming in uh, more contemporary cases in South Korea. So these chapters investigate uh, various state institutions, including courts and different commissions, as well as the legal professionals that are needed for rights claiming in the democratic era. The, the, or the institutional mechanisms that we examine in these chapters range from truth commissions to the constitutional court um, to civil litigation and the National Human Rights Commission. And the chapters really show how these institutional actors have contributed to developing rights at times, but at times they have also limited um, rights. In part, this is because of limited enforcement powers, such as from the National Human Rights Commission, of Korea or because of small budgets or lack of political will or other political priorities that have at times created challenges for rights claiming. And so the chapters together, I think, analyze how people navigate deficiencies in institutional mechanisms for rights claiming, but also how they exploit legal opportunities or new openings or new avenues for rights claiming um, or grievance articulation. And I think uh, that these chapters together indicate that rights channels on balance are becoming more accessible. And importantly, as Patricia's chapter in chapter eight 
um, demonstrates the resources, including public interest lawyering groups, have become more institutionalized, helping to make these uh, institutional mechanisms or channels more accessible to uh, potential claimants. And so I think these chapters really give you a sense of the wide range of options that um, claimants have in South Korea. And with that, I will turn it over to Patty again for part three. Okay, thanks. Okay, for part three, we move to talking about certain vulnerable groups. And so this cha these chapters analyze how vulnerable, vulnerable groups such as workers, people with disabilities and sexual and racial minorities perceive injustice, make rights-based claims, talk about rights, leverage domestic and institutional claiming channels and combine legal mobilization with other tactics. So it's very, in, this I think is a, a really interesting group of, of chapters. We see um, a divergence in tactics, not just in terms of litigation and pushing for legal reform, um, but also in um, more physical tactics such as sit-in protests or the example of um, uh, sky-high protests uh, in towers um, and, and you know, marches as well as media campaigns. So very much deploying a vast repertoire of, of um, mobilization tactics uh, for these different types of, of causes. So from these chapters, um, what we see is that uh, there are actually uh, various degrees of exploitation, uh, of attitudes of charity or stigma, um, or even um, invisibility towards some groups. But we see that there are incremental gains for marginalized groups, including legislation banning disability-based discrimination, for example, and legislation improving rights for workers. These chapters reveal how rights claiming can transform social perceptions of marginalized groups to reduce stigma and to increase the visibility of differences in Korean society. So we see that marginalized groups are beginning to have the right to have rights. And moving on next to part four. Thank you. Our final um, part in the book, part four, but definitely not the least important part, is, examines the rights of new citizens or non-citizens, which are this burgeoning category in South Korea that has received uh, relatively little attention so far. Um, so here we look in these two chapters, the contributors examine how South Korea is becoming less and less of a homogenous society and increasingly embracing universal human rights norms, and yet you have different categories of new citizens and non-citizens who may or may not have access to those rights. Um, so this change in uh, the social composition of Korea has really posed challenges to longstanding associations between ethno-national belonging and rights. Um, and this section's chapter focuses on how people who seek citizenship or residential status in Korea engage in rights talk or rights claiming. It shows how visa categories, in particular Aaron Chung's um, chapter shows how visa categories come with certain rights, creating in a sense hierarchies, is the word she uses, among immigrant groups, such as marriage migrants or co-ethnic migrant workers. Um, she also traces how ethnic Koreans are at the top of the migrant hierarchy, uh, but state designed processes, such as the one that Sheena Greitens talks about in her chapter, state designed processes like the screening of North Korean resettlers um, may actually limit uh, resettlers access to these rights. So there are um, perhaps even more so than for citizens gaps between the legally recognized rights and um, the instantiation of rights in practice. And these chapters show how both state and societal actors in Korea recognize and respect, respect a broader range of rights, um, but then in practice and including societal prejudices or even counter mobilization 
can at times constrain uh, people's access to rights and motivate further rights-based mobilization. Um, and so to wrap up, Patty is going to um, give a few final words. Okay, thanks. So looking ahead, we're, we're basically seeing that uh, the rights that are covered in this book, that many are durable, that there have been significant advancement made in terms of recognizing rights and rights protections. Um, we see an increasing number of organizations creating uh, human rights units or designating human rights officers or processes for reporting rights violations. Um, for example, universities. Uh, and this, this is really just within the past few years where now universities, one after the other, have created human rights centers or, or relabeled their, um, some of their, their student centers as human rights centers, for example. There are challenges despite uh, some of these advancements. We see that um, despite the increased accessibility and the attractiveness of judicial channels for rights claiming that litigation still remains difficult um, in terms sometimes of political will or judicial receptivity or sources, uh, resources being, being finite. Um, there is also the matter of partisan polarization uh, which can affect rights discourses, basically splitting issues as a, as a right or left uh, type of issue and uh, hindering compromises um, in many cases, for example, regarding sexual minorities rights. There, this leads us to the, the, the next issue, the next challenge of societal backlash. Um, we see that there can be significant backlash against, for example, feminist movements um, against LGBTI rights and, and even against um, asylum seekers as well. Culturally ingrained hierarchies also challenge the notion, notions of equality in human rights. Um, so we see that these hierarchies are, are very difficult to dismantle when you see um, that uh, there, are, there are many hierarchies in place based on seniority, socioeconomic status, gender or some or some combination thereof. It also remains challenging to sustain human rights awareness and protection in the face of public security issues, COVID being one notable example, um, and how sometimes the rights of, of some groups are, are, are overridden in, in the name of uh, public health. So, so in some on the one hand, we see that there's still resistance to rights claiming in terms of judicial and public receptivity and political will, and that some opponents also mobilize this language of rights to um, also bolster their, their stance. On the other hand, institutional changes, um, new resources networks have opened up uh, avenues and opportunities for rights claiming. And we think on balance that the prospects for rights claiming remain bright in Korea, and that this is mostly um, due to the creative and the persistent um, mobilization uh, and diligence of and efforts of rights claimants. So on that note, I think we can delve more into some of these um, uh, issues that we've, we've uh, spotlighted. I think we're going to turn it over to the discussants now and uh, we'll, we'll revisit some of these during Q&A as well. Thank you. All right, well, thanks so much um, to Celeste and Patty for giving that concise um, summary and also highlighting the significances of the book. Now, moving on to Heian and Paul. Heian, maybe you could begin. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to be here as part of this amazing collective. Um, I'm really honored um, and thankful for Patricia, Celeste, and Jisoo. Um, to, I'm very happy to add my comments here, especially after having participated in the earlier stage of the workshop, um, 2019, 2018? <laughs> such a long time ago. Um, but it feels really amazing to see the book all come together um, as great as, as it is right now. 
And having served as an editor of an edited volume uh, myself just once before, and I was like, never again. <laughs> and uh, I know the tremendous work, I mean, really tremendous work that goes into making a coherent and strong volume. Um, and I just want to commend both co-editors for their incredible work. Um, and I think the timing of this book, it seems like the question of rights, justice, legal protection, and mobilization uh, there's no better time to engage in these questions um, in the midst of global crisis, racial reckoning, and also the rise of anti-Asian violence that really delimits who we are and who we're not, who deserves rights and recognition and who are not. So in this moment, I think it's amazing that we have this book as a gift um, to really um, think through these questions that are not limited to Korea, but actually to you know, far beyond Korea as well. Um, so for that, to that end, I have two comments and praises and one open question for the editors and authors. Um, first, I really want to commend the editors and authors for this, um, this work that is interdisciplinary at its best. The book charts the evolution and development of the rights discourse historically and then um, examine all these legal and institutional structures that make this um, into making and uh, all um, on the ground changing struggles over rights that are happening right now. Um, these are very wide topics, uh, wide range of subjects, and this is not easy to pull this together. And the authors also range from historians, sociologists, political scientists, geographers, legal scholars, you know, like this is not an easy group to all put together in a coherent way. And I think the volume comes to get together um, in a very productive dialogue with each other. They're not all just separate from each other. And I know that this coherence is made possible only by a clear focus and vision of the editors and also collaborative engagement among the among the um, authors that are quite commendable. And I could, I could already felt that um, during the workshop and ever more um, clearer in the volume itself. Um, so that's really amazing. The second uh, common praise is, um, I really love and appreciate the grounded bottom-up approach that this volume takes. Um, without predetermining what rights are and how they work, this book as a whole reveal how on the ground contestations, both um, individual and, and collective level um, for rights claiming have shaped the legal and political infrastructures in South Korea and also transformed citizenship and civil society mobilization as well. And in the diverse cases of women's rights, disability rights, labor rights and LGBT rights, just to name a few. And in the book, um, and I'm sure later the authors will be able to speak more in depth about these, um, but in the book, you will find a very in-depth and rich analysis of all, of all these cases in each of the chapters. So I would highly recommend anybody um, to really um, take a deep dive and see these chapters in conversation with each, with each other. Uh, so my last question and kind of opening thought, um, something I would like to hear a bit more from the editors and authors and from the audience as well. Now that the book has been completed and we can maybe take a step back and uh, you know, deal with the question that I continue to struggle with. Um, uh, what I continue to struggle with with the language of rights is its inherent coupling um, you know, as a discourse and as a toolkit with the system that it came out of, which is a historically specific form of modern liberal democracy, right? That takes the individual as subject of rights, um, takes the rule of law as a main frame and has a fairly narrow notion of who rights bearing citizens, who rights bearing subjects are in terms of race, gender and class, you know, and have pretty much violently excluded others from that framework. That's a history we cannot, you know, step away from. And so if we take that history seriously, does it change how and when we approach and use the rights discourse? How do we address the claims of claims to dignity, respect, freedom, and justice with the language of rights, um, especially when we were not necessarily part of that design of the subjectivity that this language was supposed to 
serve? Um, for what purpose does rights as a tool work well and for what others does it not? Uh, what does it enable us to do and what does it preclude? Do we even have other discourse to utilize if it's not right? Um, if we have, then why, what would they be? You know, these are the questions um, that I've recently, especially thinking more in the rise of this anti-Asian racism and violence. And I'm personally, um, and I've been a bit hesitant that all this righteous anger and energy are sometimes being caught up in the question of whether certain kinds of attack is hate crime or not. You know, that, that could become a particularly like a technical legal debate that um, may not really address the social issues that we're facing. But um, when it's caught up in law, when, I, when it's caught up in the language of rights, um, then what does it enable us to do? What does it not enable us to do? And many chapters in this book address this tension and paradox in very um, different and in-depth ways. And I would like us to um, continue this discussion as an intellectual um, collective. Um, and I think to end, uh, to deepen our understanding and this continuing reflection, I think this book would be a really an excellent guide for all of us, um, especially those who are interested in law and society, um, social movements, and politics in South Korea and beyond. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you. It's a great privilege to uh, discuss and help celebrate the publication of Rice Claiming in South Korea. Uh, I've only been tangentially related to human rights research in South Korea. Patty and I were actually part of a small group who founded the SSK Human Rights Forum more than 10 years ago now, uh, which helped to develop the study of rights in Korea, especially looking toward a global audience for our work. Uh, from that vantage point, it was clear, at least to me, that there were very few studies of rights in Korea in English, and especially studies that both went back further into the past and also covered the contemporary period. So the current volume is indeed a much needed publication and an important contribution to our understanding of rights claiming in Korea. And I look forward to using the book in classes with undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, I had the fortune of reading the pre-published manuscript to prepare for today's meeting. And what immediately stood out was the comprehensiveness of the volume that reached back to the pre-modern Joseon dynasty, something that uh, Han mentioned as well, covered the colonial period, explored the possibilities of rights in the immediate post-liberation period, and then includes case studies that takes us up to today. So it really is a comprehensive account of the study of rights in Korean history. Uh, and it seems to me that the editors are being rather humble when they write that the volume does not provide an overall narrative of the development of rights in Korea. Uh, maybe so, but the different chapters taken together anyway do indeed trace the evolution of the concept of rights as they are, quote, shaped, defined, and acted upon within particular temporal spatial contexts. Uh, and I've, I've always been a sucker for genealogies and origin stories, so I really did learn a lot from the, quote, genealogy of rights in Korea that this volume provides. Uh, to this point, one of the great strengths of the volume is its ability to show the connections across time while being careful to lay out the unique characteristics of distinct historical moments. And as with most studies that span time, it's a delicate balance between identifying universal patterns while also trying not to impose contemporary concepts and arguments to the past. Uh, in the few minutes I have, I'd like to highlight two analytical themes or approaches that organize the analyses across the chapters. And these two themes, I believe, are what makes this volume such an important contribution. Uh, the first, as I mentioned, is the comprehensive nature of the volume, maybe more an approach than a theme, but the volume provides a systematic account of rights claiming in Korea in at least two distinct ways. First, as noted, the chapters cover the major historical periods and show how rights were manifest at different time points. We learn about, for example, the quote, framework with which to address grievances during the Joseon dynasty and how women use this framework to not only make their voices heard, but also to win real concessions. Uh, these legal mechanisms evolved during the colonial period, as we learned from uh, Sung Young Lim's chapter. But throughout the 20th century, what stood out, uh, for me anyway, was what Jisoo Kim identifies as the, quote, commonly accepted norm of rectifying injustice on page 20 that undergird the, that undergird the different legal possibilities for claiming rights across time. Uh, this, of course, speaks to that same balance between context-specific analysis and uncovering the connections that run throughout history. Uh, the comprehensive approach is manifest in a second way as well, 
Uh, I really appreciated the multifaceted lens to understanding rights claims. Some monographs may focus on the philosophical or cultural foundations for rights. Others may focus on what Celeste Arrington calls in her chapter, quote, legal opportunity structures. And still others may focus on the promises and challenges of rights reflected in social movements and collective action, like we learned from Ngyong Kim, Chuan Kim, Judy Han, and Aaron Chung's chapters uh, on movement hierarchies and the, quote, politics of postponement. Rarely, however, does a single study address all of these relevant aspects of rights claiming at the same time. Um, and perhaps more importantly, the volume not only identifies these diverse realms of rights claiming, but crucially explicates the mutual dependency between them. This is the quote, relational approach that the editors appropriate to connect the different chapters into a comprehensive account of rights claiming, which is why I thought there was indeed an overall narrative of some kind. Uh, for example, we learned from the chapters in part two that even as protections for some rights were codified in the 1948 Korean Constitution, South Korean Constitution, and other institutions, the promise of these legal mechanisms is only realized when different aggrieved populations take it upon themselves to actualize their rights through these legal opportunities. The truth commissions we learned about in Hun Jun Kim's chapter, the National Human Rights Commission in South Korea in Su Young Hwang's chapter, and the Constitutional Court itself highlighted in Hans Mosler's chapter are only relevant if and when aggrieved populations are able to make use of them and turn their quote, rights on the books to rights in practice. Uh, indeed, it's the interaction between collection and these rights. Uh, we learn in this section that the relational nature between the law, institutions, collective action, and changing cultural notions involves an iterative process. Of particular importance is the ability of institutional mechanisms to shape rights narratives and public understanding as shown in Mosler's chapter. But at the same time, uh, Jaewon Kim's chapter clearly shows the important role of activists in expanding legal opportunities as they did with the Disability Discrimination Act of 2007, which is also reflected in a more general way in the activism of public interest lawyers described in Patricia Getty's chapter. And of course, once laws are expanded and revised, they become resources for future rights claims. Uh, in short, as Celeste Arrington argues, uh, legal opportunity structures evolve based on the public's expanding notion of rights and the pressures they place on the government, which at the same time limit and bound collective action. So given the multiple actors, institutions, and legal me mechanisms involved, it's not surprising, it's perhaps not surprising then that some groups are more successful than others in claiming rights. The chapters in parts three and four of the volume clearly spell this out. While some groups are subsumed under the banner of democracy and told to wait and quote, postpone their rights, others are limited by the very hierarchies created amongst marginalized communities, such as non-citizen migrants and North Korean uh, resettlers. The contest about what a comprehensive anti-discrimination bill will entail, outlined in Chie Kim and Sung Su Hong's chapter, I believe best captures this tension be uh, between a Korea that is moving towards universal rights protections and the unequal effectiveness of expanding rights mechanisms. Uh, overall then, it seems to me that the great strength of the volume as a whole is to identify the diverse forces that are quote, out there to be utilized by aggrieved populations, which then through their utilization are revised to reshape the possibilities of rights in Korean society for future generations. Uh, and to pos possibly further the discussion, I want to bring up a few things that were sparked by the chapters in the volume. Notwithstanding moments of clarification and distinction, say between the concept of rights in Joseon Dynasty, Korli, and the modern notion of human rights, Inkwon, there seems to be a rather easy flow throughout the volume between different manifestations of the general concept of rights. The more generally applicable term rights allows the editors and chapter authors to emphasize the first half of the balance I mentioned between atemporal universal versus context specific processes. But are all rights the same? For example, are the legal, political, and social processes related to the right to historical truth, dominant in Hun Jun Kim's chapter, the same as the mechanisms governing labor rights or the right to work outlined in Yoon Gyeong Lee's chapter? Or is the struggle for co-ethnic and perhaps now co-national recognition amongst North Korean defectors similar to the politics of representation or recognition we see in the rights movements of sexual minorities or non-citizen migrants. Can all of these different types of rights be subsumed under the master frame of human rights? 
um, discussed in Xiong Huang's chapter so that Korea can indeed uh, come into its own as a quote, advanced nation. Uh, these more subtle distinctions may be important for the central arguments laid out in the volume. If, for example, the nexus of law, institutions, collective action, mass media, and cultural norms are reconfigured depending on the specific right under investigation. That is, from all that we learn across the different chapters of the volume, is it possible to move towards a systematic accounting of how different rights are associated with different legal opportunity structures such that we can better account for or make sense of the unequal success that different aggrieved populations have had claiming their rights? Uh, these are some of the questions that came to mind as I tried to digest the many important insights across the volume chapters. Uh, but again, I want to express a huge congratulations to the editors and chapter authors of this important volume. I'm very much looking forward to, as I said, using the book in my Korean classes. And as I have, uh, I'm excited by how much the students are going to learn from it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Hei Chu and Paul Chung for their very insightful comments. Um, and also, I want to uh, reiterate my thanks to uh, Celeste and Patty for all of the work they put into this edited volume. Um, as um, we heard, just heard, it's never easy to pull something like this together, um, especially with contributors from three different continents, I believe, right? Um, and But they did so with great patience, um, precision, and generosity, uh, reading and commenting on multiple drafts of our chapters and uh, bringing this um, book to fruition with Cambridge University Press on a very short timeline. Um, I also want to thank uh, the George Washington Institute for uh, Korean Studies for their generous support of the edited volume and also of our original um, conference in April 2018, I believe, um, where I did have the pleasure of actually meeting some of my fellow contributors for the first time. And then, of course, um, uh, uh, seeing some of my um, cherished colleagues um, uh, otherwise, um, and where we spent, um, you know, basically two very intense productive days discussing one another's papers in person. I really do miss that. Um, finally, I'm um, very much delighted that so many of my fellow contributors are able to join us today, uh, despite the time difference. And thank you, especially to those of you who are, for whom um, it's very late or um, very early in the morning. Um, so I just want to begin with some uh, brief responses to uh, Heian and Paul's comments, but I also very much look forward to hearing from my colleagues um, as well. So. I think that it, it's it's very clear, um, Patty, Celeste, um, Heian, and Paul made it clear that this volume really challenges the idea that we have kind of this idealized universality of kind of liberal democratic rights, um, or the idea that you know rights have been applied evenly to citizen and non-citizen uh, populations, um, and this is true for not just Korea but um, you know for other for you know basically all parts of the world. Um, in other words, you know, we know that legal inclusion and um, exclusion from na national membership alone uh, doesn't necessarily correspond with access to civil protections, um, social welfare benefits, or democratic institutions and uh, representation. So the chapters in this volume demonstrate the myriad ways that state and non-state actors engage in practices that on the one hand uh, may deny the full citizenship of marginalized citizen groups, right? And on the other, um, how citizens and non-citizens in Korea uh, relate to the state and dominant society. Um, it, it, they also, it also shows how um, they mobilize themselves and voice their collective interests and also make claims uh, to rights and recognition uh, with appeals to human dignity, human rights, and democratic inclusion, for example. Um, and also um, these chapters show how they've used the tried and true strategies, right? Such as protests, candlelight vigils, petitions, public awareness campaigns, litigation uh, and lobbying. And I also think that um, the chapters are very clear about how they build on networks uh, made up of a range of civil society groups, such as women, labor, students, um, religious organizations, lawyers, um, and uh, myriad citizen organizations. Uh, so, um, as Paul pointed out, by looking at rights claiming in Korea over time, 
we're able to observe patterns across iterated struggles. So we know that after all, you know, grassroots movements and claims making don't transpire in a vacuum, right? Um, on the contrary, the residuals of prior struggles for democracy, uh, recognition and rights shape later forms of rights claiming. And I think that, that um, looking at kind of um, a long history of rights claiming really does help us to identify um, patterns, right? As well as kind of um, specific forms of rights claiming um, that are um, very much shaped by um, the political and um, social and economic context. Um, another thing that I think that um, this volume does very nicely is it helps us to push beyond binaries, you know, about um, our discussion of rights. And this is sort of addressing what Hayon uh, was asking about um, when is rights useful and, and you know, whether or not uh, rights is a, is a tool um, that we should continue to, to use to discuss um, um, social justice and and you know uh, differences between citizens and uh, non-citizens so forth. So um, I think one of the strengths is that rather than dichotomize this system of you know democratic citizenship for citizens and then undemocratic uh, non-citizenship for foreigners, for example, or assume that citizenship itself is simply a formal set of rights and privileges that are granted by the state. Um, this volume really examines the interactions, negotiations, and contestations, right, between state and non-state actors. That includes, you know, includes citizens, non-citizens, and those who might be in between, right, um, as well as the contingencies of rights. And, um, you know, one particular strength of this volume is its focus on bottom-ups, bottom-up rights claiming and overlooked actors, right? Um, my paper for, uh, my chapter, for example, um, examines uh, migrant rights in Korea, as was mentioned earlier. And, you know, certainly while the idea of what I call rights for non-citizenship may seem uh, counterintuitive, I think it is a productive framework through which we can explore kind of the gray areas of citizenship uh, and the contingencies um, of rights. And basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm um, looking at the ways in which migrant rights have expanded significantly over the past few decades. Um, but I argue that these rights are allocated differentially to specific categories of migrants based on their visa categories that are themselves informed by ascriptive criteria such as gender, um, ethnicity, and uh, country of origin um, that go well beyond demands in the labor market. Um, and I basically argue that the proliferation of visa categories have led to the development of non-citizen hierarchies that institutionalize the privileged status of some migrants over others and then integrate others as um, wives or co-ethnics um, and uh, potential citizens while also excluding others permanently as sojourners um, and foreigners who are not eligible for uh, permanent uh, citizens. And, um, what I try to do is, is um, discuss the ways in which um, these kind of rights claiming by non-citizens are actually building on previous rights claims. This is, a, I, I use the term civic legacies, which I've developed in um, my a recently published book on immigrant incorporation and East Asian democracies, basically to refer to the ideas, networks, and strategies that were applied in previous struggles uh, for democratic inclusion um, that shape how civil society actors, including immigrants themselves, uh, make claims to the state, um, negotiate exclusionary policies, and also un understand and interpret democratic inclusion uh, and uh, uh, political empowerment. So I, I think that rather than discussing the ways in which rights may be relative, right? I, I think it's important to just discuss the ways in which rights are contested and negotiated, right? So that's, I think that's a kind of a productive way to, to think about um, rights claiming, um, not just in South Korea, but more generally. So, you know, by expanding, um, the boundaries of you know how and where we study rights claiming that is not only in Western liberal democracies but also in societies where we might assume that uh, rights, especially individual rights, um, uh, is a type of foreign concept. 
Um, I do believe that we're better equipped to interrogate kind of these conventional understandings of phenomena that are commonly associated with uh, Western classifications on the one hand uh, and cultural assumptions about politics and society throughout the world on the other. Um, and I just want to um, make one last response about Hayan's uh, a question about um, kind of how we talk about uh, rights and uh, who, you know, who are rights bearing citizens and um, you know, when does rights as a tool uh, work well and when doesn't it work well, especially to this, uh, to this current moment. Um, uh, so uh, following the Atlanta shootings. Um, so I think that one thing that has um, become especially clear in the wake of the Atlanta shootings is that um, we have so often talked about um, the rights, especially group rights as a type of zero sum rights, right? Basically the idea that um, rights for one group um, means that um, another group's rights are threatened or taken away, right? Um, and especially among uh, marginalized communities, and we see this certainly um, in the in the chapters where we where that discuss the collision of rights claims, right? Um, especially in that case, we we see how these rights claims themselves actually drive a wedge between communities, right? Um, and result in in marginalized communities um, competing over already scarce rights, right? Um, and um, you know this this results in um, types of hierarchies, you know, between citizens and and non citizens um, themselves, and and really. Um, you know, it, it makes it much more challenging to create coalitions, right? Um, even within labor, for example, and, and I, you know, one of our chapters certainly discusses this really well, you know, the, um, even uh, within the labor movement, we see um, wedge, a wedge being driven between part-time versus um, full-time labor, right? Um, and informal versus formal labor. Um, and so I think it is, um, it is a cautionary tale about how um, rights claiming is not always um, empowering, right? Especially when it's about competing for very, very limited rights um, between marginalized groups, rather than actually pushing for the expansion of rights overall as both Paul and Hayon discussed. So I'd like to now um, invite um, my colleagues to also um, respond to some of the, um, the questions and comments that Paul and Hayon um, brought up. So this is the fun part of having the webinar on Zoom from across uh, three continents, I guess. Um, we have our contributors are also able to join us. Um, so I know Sheena had mentioned that she wanted to respond to some of the um, discussants comments but in the questions in our Q&A. For the rest of you, if you want to respond, please let me know. Um, and I also just want to thank Hayon, Paul, and Aaron for your really insightful comments. So go ahead, Sheena. Yeah, first of all, thanks so much for, for organizing this event um, and, uh, and really for, for taking the lead on organizing a terrific volume. Um, having read the papers individually, I'm also excited to sort of go back over the final volume and to see you know, each of these connections and the things that you can draw together when you actually hold a, a book, at least for me, in, in our, our hands. Um, so congratulations and thank you for, um, for putting this conversation uh, in, 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 in generating it for all of us. Um, I guess, I, you know, I wanted to echo Aaron's comment about the importance of looking at um, the contestation around rights and what they are, how people access them, um, who gets to participate in the contestation process, what resources they have, all of the, the questions that the volume comes at in so many different ways. Um, and the, in the chapter that, um, that I worked on, I focused on um, the process by which North Koreans who are entering South Korea um, try to claim citizen standing um, because citizenship is by one definition, the right to have rights, the right to have a certain set of rights that are, are offered with citizenship. And you can think of that either in terms of formal legal status or sort of more of an, an a communitarian and largely co-ethnic conception of, of what it means to be a, a citizen in this case of the Republic of Korea. Um, and the, the main argument of the volume is that although 
North Koreans have both a legal and a communitarian claim to the rights of membership, um, the actual processes of crossing the border and trying to enter um, South Korea just show how very much the contestation in practice actually matters um, for the effect, uh, the effective um, attempt to claim claim rights, to claim the status, to claim the rights of citizenship, um, and you know how very contingent um, some of those rights are on very specific state recognition of, of identity. Um, and so the, the chapter looks at, at the idea, um, my colleague at, here at UT, Wendy Hunter, has written some things about effective statelessness. So people who, um, people who might qualify for citizenship under the law, but have no proof that that is in fact who they are. And the fact that that in some ways inverts the rights of citizenship and makes citizenship something that the government can grant rather than something that citizens have um, as a, a natural right and something that is intrinsic to their, their, their personhood. Um, and so, so I, you know, the reason that I, I um, uh, volunteered to, to comment was um, seeing the, the question that's in the Q&A here about whether or not South Korea asserts protection of rights of Koreans living in North Korea or overseas. Um, and, and legally under a couple of different pieces of, of Korean law, um, North Koreans are, are considered um, citizens of the Republic of Korea. Um, but what we see is that geopolitics pretty heavily circumscribes where and how the state actively recognizes those rights, let alone advocates for um, the, the sort of positive or affirmative rights of North Koreans. Um, and so this particular chapter focuses on the border crossing process for, for folks who have left North Korea who are seeking to resettle in, in South Korea and effectively claim their citizen status there. Um, but I think the, the broader question is a, a good one. And what we see is that um, there's been a little bit of, of variation over time and sometimes administration over how the rights of North Koreans are constructed by the state discursively and how they are, are discussed or advocated for. Um, but in particular, um, in I would say at the, the present moment, although there have been some changes to try to provide assistance to North Koreans overseas who seek to resettle in the ROK, um, the ROK has also taken a pretty limited um, view and pretty heavily circumscribed participation in the sort of more classic Western liberal democratic um, construction of human rights, for example, um, having declined to participate in the UN resolutions on North Korean human rights for the past several years. Um, and one of the things that um, this chapter is, is part of a larger, I hope eventually book project um, that looks at North Koreans on a global stage. And one of the things that we find um, in doing that research is that during the migration and resettlement process, um, North Koreans have to work really, really hard to get recognized as purported citizens of the ROK. Um, that, that they are, are not generally um, treated with equal status in terms of consular or citizen services overseas. Um, and so this is again, an issue of what the hierarchy of rights is and how it manifests itself when citizens are outside the territorial borders of, of, the, um, of the Republic of Korea, in this case, third countries abroad. Um, so I hope that begins to at least answer the question. I know some other folks may have things to add to that. Um, and I wanna, I, um, we, I, I look forward to hearing what others have to say, but thanks. Thank you very much, Sheena. Um, do any of the other contributors want to respond at, right now? Go ahead, Honjun. Your chapter really nicely lays out uh, the, the changes in rights discourses over time. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the very, um, you know, the comments. Uh, I, uh, I'll address them. And then uh, I think, uh, first of all, I would think like, uh, thank you know, you know, editors and then also the older participant because you know, I think the, the initial chapter that I had had a lot of change, you know, from the last chapter that I have because, and that tells me a, a lot about, you know, how my conception about rights has also transformed and changed by this book project. So I want to thank you for broadening my understanding of rights because previously when I started this project, I mainly focused on human rights and then the victims. And because of the, the topics that I address, it was always victims versus the states. 
and then it was the, the competition between them. And then the, since the victims had the various voices, I emphasized the vo victims' voices. But once, you know, after the workshop, and then contextualizing all the rights, uh, you know, historically, and then from a different perspective and from the different discipline, I realized that the, the rights claim are much broader than the human rights. Or, you know, as a poem mentioned, you know, different you know types of rights are there. So I learned. And then, I, I, and then also, uh, because of you were thinking about the clash between the rights, I was thinking about also about what kind of rights that the other part, you know, counterparts had. And then when I look at that, you know, I, I also learned that those people who were, you know, against this kind of, a, you know, human rights were also claiming, making the rights claims. And then for them, they, that was real. And then for them, that was, uh, you know, very uh, serious. You know, and then I investigated in that, and then I tried to examine the the kind of a clash of the uh, rights claims, and then uh, that was kind of eye opening moment for me. And then especially because of the rights are much broader and they're much dynamic, and then it had a very um, I think um, um, much wider than, than than I thought. So you know, for that particular project, I learned that you know by doing this kind of interdisciplinary work, uh, it could be. Uh, you know, uh, it could change my, you know, my my conception, and also it opens up another dialogue for us, you know, to to work in the future. And I think this book will, uh, you know, eventually will be used in some classrooms and then read by some scholars, and then to start up, you know, the further dialogue because that 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 particular thing that we have so far is kind of current. Uh, something that we had and that we have seen at this point and then but I think we since the change of the you know global politics and then domestic politics in the US and South Korea because I think it will again be a, a good platform for us to start to work and then reconsider and then think about what is changing at this point and then how dynamic those rights are and then the rights can be used as a, sometimes vehicles and then sometimes tools within a uh, political structures. So I think it is very meaningful moment. And I think, as uh, Chu mentioned, uh, Heian mentioned, I think this is a really good timing, you know, for the book to be out. And then I've had several inquiries from some of the, my, you know, uh, colleague and student about when the book is going to be out. They are very interesting. So uh, I'm looking forward to have that kind of a conversation with everyone and then, you know, every participant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honjun. I think it's a, a really nice reminder um, also of how rights is not a fixed um, term, but often gets lumped together. So for example, in the introduction, um, we tried to take stock of some of the different rights that have been asserted. So there's some power, some attractiveness in the using the, the term rights or adding kwon to the end of Korean words. So we, for example, had the right to subsistence, the right to privacy, the right to mobility, or the right to health, the right to life, these are all floating around in the air in South Korea and have some um, power for mobilization, power for um, attracting media attention, and um, yet there are still tensions um, and contestation over what exactly they mean and who gets the right to have these rights. So Yung Young, did you want to respond or Song Yun? I'll just uh, briefly respond to uh, Heian's uh, comment and uh, what uh, other uh, contributors have said. Um, when I'm thinking about all the um, chapters uh, included in this volume and uh, the arguments that are presented, I think um, I, I think a lot about a human agency and also. Um, the possibilities and limitations of uh, democratic um, uh, institutions. So on the one hand, we have all these you know, different groups um, mobilizing and demanding their entitlement to certain rights. So in that sense, uh, uh, we see a lot of moments when human agency is exercised in, uh, in, in, a, in a very critical way. But at the same time, Yes, they, these different groups uh, attach so much um, expectation and aspirations for democratic politics, but at the same time, I think they're pointing out the limitations of uh, democratic institutions because uh, even uh, in the moments when uh, these uh, 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 rights claims uh, are uh, written 
in uh, laws and public policies, that also means that certain people's rights are included because basically legislation is about inclusion and exclusion, right? So what kind of people will be included and what kind of people will be excluded is the language of law. So in that sense, I think this you know, inclusion um, speaks to the possibilities of these you know, democratic processes and claim making politics. But at the same time, I think it, it also shows the limitations uh, when these moments uh, happen. So uh, just to um, echo back to uh, what, you know, Erin already said, I think uh, many of these uh, chapters really emphasize the, the process of contestation, <laughs> the process of negotiation and, and the process of limitations that lead to another moment of um, contestation and mobilization and, and claim making. Yeah, I think, thank you so much for, for these, um, all these great points. Um, Han, your, your question just hit the nail on the head in terms of the utility of, of rights talk, rights discourse. And I think we wrestled with that from the beginning, Chisu, Celeste and I, um, we, we played with, with what, would, what frame would work. And um, I think we talked about access to justice. We talked about um, justice generally um, how to remedy grievances and, and rights just sort of came as the umbrella, <laughs> umbrella frame, frame for that. Um, but, but I know what you're saying. I mean, who has scripted rights from the beginning, uh, right? <laughs> pun, no pun intended or maybe intended. Um, so we know that rights, um, if we're looking at it from Western philosophy, very legalistic, uh, in terms of entitlement, um, rights used to oppress other civilizations, um, rights can be violent um, and, and it can be elitist very much so. And so I think that's, that was one of the goals of our project was to come with a more grassroots perspective to dive into the gray areas, um, to talk about the contestations, the, the manipulations, the negotiations, and to kind of reclaim rights from the Korean perspective, from Korean voices, from, you know, with Korean agency. And so that's what we're trying for, but I think we're still open to talking about rights and I still struggle with this in my classes. Um, can we just use something other than, than rights or human rights over and over again, can we just go back to talking about kindness, uh, dignity, uh, human value, um, social justice? Can we just, can we, we work with different frames? Um, and, I, and I think we still have to be open to, to different types of discourses, but you're right. For this purpose, um, this was the toolkit that we used. And, and I think it was, I think it worked um, across disciplines. I, I think it, I think it did work for this, this purpose, this project. Um, but that said, I think, um, I think for future researchers that, that we can take this, we can spin this out in, in so many different ways. And, and Paul, I really um, like your question as well in terms of um, what's the matrix of rights? You know, how, how can we map out um, different rights um, how they're associated with different uh, legal opportunity structures. When do certain rights claims work for certain groups and how? I mean, this would be incredible for uh, somebody else <laughs> to basically um, to chart out and to see, uh, because I, I think we have so many colorful stories here. Um, if somebody can come up with a methodology for analyzing these stories, I think that would be a great next step project. Um, and, I, and I'd love to see that in the future. I think we had some early questions that had been mailed in earlier. Um, um, somebody would like to know what areas, specific areas of rights claiming and or substantial rights that, that we wanted to include in the volume, but we were unable to incorporate into the volume. And I think, I think this is a, a really great question and I leave it open to anybody. Um, there, there were a number of topics we wanted to add, but this would have turned into <laughs> a much heavier book. Um, I, for example, would have loved to have talked about um, Korean adoptees. Um, there are even stateless children as well. Um, I, I think 
we were, we were hoping for a, a couple of additional contributions for, for the last part. Um, and uh, we were just, I think, running, running out with our, our timeline there. I think originally we had also um, discussed um, sort of the, the hot button political issue now about corruption and um, claimants in South Korea alleging um, official corruption. And there's, there's a lot of kind of rights talk in that process. Um, another category that we toyed with were students um, in South Korea who, for example, during the pandemic, there have been constitutional court claims made to try to recoup tuition um, fees, not to give anybody any bad ideas, um, <laughs> because <laughs> online teaching is not sufficient. Um, but the, uh, the other category that we had um, talked about were women in the contemporary era, because we have these three historical chapters on women's rights, and we had talked about somehow bridging that into, say, Korea's Me Too movement um, and trying to address that um, activism. But anybody else? Any, any, volume two, Sheena, go ahead. I, I think the, the um, some a little bit more breadth than, I, first of all, I would say the volume is sort of stunning in its comprehensiveness, both temporally and sectorally, or, or in terms of the, the inclusiveness of, of the, the breadth of the, the um, questions it does ask. So I, I say this not like, more as a volume two than as any, any sort of um, critique, but I think that, you know, looking at the rights of overseas Koreans, I think the, the adoptee issue would have been a really interesting one to, um, to include. And then obviously something that I think has come up a lot, um, I don't think there was a way to incorporate it in this particular volume, but as you mentioned, we've been struggling with questions around um, the pandemic and its impact on rights and contestation over rights in a public health emergency. And um, you know, South Korea has a history with both a public health emergency itself, um, with MERS as well as um, you know, other uses of emergency provisions that have curtailed citizen rights over the course of Korea's you know, sort of post, um, post-Korean more history. And so I think some, um, some look at that at some future date would be really, um, those would be interesting areas of research, um, as well as the, the issue of, of women and, um, and rights around Korea's Me Too movement. So those are all areas I would love to see someone pick up and, and tackle in an article or a future project. Yeah, we had. Um, oh, sorry. We had sorry. just really quickly. We had. We had. Um, in our conclusion, we maybe have a paragraph about about the pandemic. But anyway, um, was it Paul who wanted to go next? I was just going to say maybe rights associated with class and inequality, um, especially related to the youth and the uh, the health chosen discourse that's going around and the demographic crisis and how people, especially the young folks in Korea, feel like they don't have access to the most basic things to have. Like if you want to talk about Sengmyeongkwan, it's not just physical life to, you know, like medical, physical life, but actually the, the right to have a life, a social life. And without access to housing and jobs, you can't have families, you can't marry, you can't have children, all the things that, you know, we consider. I think that's one of the biggest uh, pressing social problems Korea is facing now. So maybe rights can be incorporated into that. Um, if I may <laughs> jump, uh, jump in and add to the discussion, uh, one thing that I've been recently thinking about, you know, uh, like especially looking at what's uh, happening in South Korea right now, I mean, uh, I think about a month, a little more than a month ago, there, um, this, you know, this, um, uh, this transgender, um, uh, he was referred to by uh, Pyon Hisa, right? Um, he um, he committed well. She she committed suicide. So she she um, performed. Uh, she got the surgery uh, while she was in the military, and then um, you know she went through just such a hard uh, hard time for about a year, and then she ended up uh, committing suicide. And one thing that really makes me question is, I mean, the constitutional, the constitution of South Korea specifies individuals' pursuit of happiness. And then when we think about this individual, what do we mean by individual here, right? Because currently, I mean, um, there are many, you know, uh, many subjects who are still not protected. Um, by the state. 
And uh, I know that in South Korea, when we have, you know, in ID, uh, we, there's, um, you know, when it starts with number one, it's men. And when it starts with number two, it's women. But there are those people who belong to neither. And, uh, and that really raises a lot of uh, their rights issues. And um, I know there's still a lot, uh, you know, a long way to go when it comes to, you know, uh, developing uh, sexual minority rights in South Korea. But I think this is really the time uh, to really move forward and uh, begin thinking about, you know, minorities, not just sexual minorities, but all, uh, many other minorities in South Korea to protect their rights. And talking about rights, going back to chosen period that I, you know, that I uh, work on, I think at least uh, in the context of chosen, uh, you do have this, you know, um, although rights, as I mentioned in my uh, chapter, there was no term for it in East Asia, not just in Korea, but in East Asia in general. Um, the term rights, quali, was only introduced in late 19th century. And be, but that does not, the lack of word does not necessarily mean that there was lack of practice. Obviously, as I have shown in my book th through petitioning um, uh, practice, I mean, people were seeking their rights in their own way. So rights to property, rights to, um, you know, uh, family honor, uh, rights to one's life and so forth. So one thing that I can say uh, that in the chosen period, uh, everybody, regardless of you know gender or one's social status, they had right to life because nobody had right to kill another person, even if it were slaves. Uh, even sl slaves were protected uh, uh, when it comes to preserving their life. And then I would also say right to petition because uh, everybody, regardless of one's gender or status, they were they had the. Uh, right to address uh, uh, their grievances to the state. And I he see here in the uh, Q&A that uh, one question was addressed to me, whether that emotional uh, performance uh, survived in the 20th century. And I would say, I think that kind of, although uh, the uh, uh, petitioning strategies and performance strategies has changed, have, have changed, I would say that that kind of emotional performance continued throughout the 20th century. And we still see today and, you know, um, in, in, in the current South Korea. So for example, during the, there was one practice in the Chosun, which was Hyerso, which is a petition written by blood, just to show the degree of one's, you know, one's, um, one's uh, grievances to the state. And you do see Hyerso that a blood petitions during the colonial period. And um, also I, I do, uh, and, and I, I'm sure, uh, you know, in the post-liberation period, there are also several uh, cases that we see. And uh, that's also, you know, that's been common. Uh, and also, you even today, if you go in front of uh, Blue House, you will see one person protesting, right, holding this, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, like the, the some kind of uh, you know written comments about what their uh, what their grievances are. And so you definitely do see that kind, of, although that kind of you know continuation of performing their grievances in public space in uh, current South Korea. Um, Although those, you know, strategies have uh, evolved uh, in, in in terms of like what kind of strategies that people have been using, but we definitely see uh, people exercising their agency in that way. So I, I hope I answered uh, one question that was addressed to me and also made some comments about the book. I just want to quickly echo that um, uh, the transgender issue that Jisoo has brought up. I think it's really important, and I think. Um, you know, Jihye Kim and Song Soo Hong's chapter in this volume um, on anti-discrimination law really brings that issue to the to the fore. Um, and personally, I would actually love to see if there's volume two, um, more um, like pre-colonial um, chapters would actually, I would love to see more um, like the, the the class and caste politics in Joseon period or earlier. I, as a non-historian, I will always um, that that's such an important issue that I actually don't know enough about, and I would love to learn. And just um, I have a a, a chapter, uh, an article on Me Too movement coming out in November. So when that comes out, I'll share it with you, with you all. Thank you. Um, we have a question also from uh, Don Kirk who asks what. A, whether we wanted to include a chapter about the freedom of the press or the rights of journalists. And so that kind of contributes to this laundry list for um, 
volume two of journalists. Um, he writes, the current government is repressing free press through appointments um, to leadership of TV networks and intimidation or of cr um, criticism in the media. And this uh, certainly applies to every administration, just flips sides uh, between the conservatives and the progressives in Korea, who gets to criticize whom. Um, but the, the role of the media, I think, is something that we, we could include more on in this chapter. Um, and it's a great point. Thank you. Yeah, I would add to that uh, the role of religion as well. I think some of that gets teased out in, in some of the contributions, but um, there's very much uh, a dynamic role played by different religious groups. Um, for example, some pub public interest lawyers uh, have, uh, have strong Christian background, which promotes um, advocacy for vulnerable groups. At the same time, as a couple of the chapters have shown, you have more um, uh, fundamental um, Protestant groups, which are very much um, opposing um, rights for LGBTI. Um, uh, you'll see different religious coalitions coming together pro the Anti-Discrimination Act, for example, or against it. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, for volume two, it would be really interesting to see the role of, of religion as well. I'd like to add just one, it's not really answering the question of what would we, what else would we like to include, but um, I think that one thing that we haven't discussed as much in part because um, uh, Judy Han wasn't able to, to join us is the uh, uh, political value of time, right? And, and the politics of postponement, which I think is so critical in our discussion of, of rights, right? Because um, in some ways, you know, as as Jung Young um, noted, you know, in regards to the the limits of of legal language, right, where that that is um, necessarily includes is about inclusion as well as exclusion. It's also about recognition, right, and legibility. You have to actually have to be legible to the state to make claims to the state, right, and and you have to actually uh, be recognized as as forming something to make you know claims to rights. And um, I think that. Judy's chapter on um, sexual minority rights and the politics of postponement in particular is, is so compelling uh, because uh, she dis discusses the ways in which um, the state is actually able, and state and, and social actors are able to um, use postponement as a strategy, as a political strategy, right? To deny rights without actually denying rights, right? To, to postpone rights indefinitely. And I think that says a lot about um, how those who don't have legibility, right, who, who may not be legible to the state, who are not categorized at, um, as, as actually constituting, um, a, you know, a legal category, for example, or is, or is, or um, making up a group that is not recognized by dominant society, right? How their rights um, get negotiated and put to the side and and postponed. Um, and how in many ways that, that deprives them of, of the language of rights, right? And, and maybe even some of the um, institutions of rights claiming. Um, and I think that would be something, you know, certainly worth considering is, is how time, right? The political value of time and rights um, come together. Just, can I just really quickly uh, add to that? Um, the, I thought one of the most powerful things in Judy's chapter was that it was the feminist in a room with um, Moon Jae-in Moon Jae was it Moon Jae yeah, Moon Jae that were telling the LGBTQI folks or advocates that they should wait. So I think that speaks to Aaron, your chap, your, your analytical framework about hierarchies because the other thing I'll, Captain, and it's too bad Sheena's not here, but um, Catherine Moon has this really interesting Brookings paper where she talks about how North Korean defectors as they claim resources to the government are actually trying to put down the migrants, like the foreigners, like the multicultural families and the um, marriage migrants, because we're truly Korean, we have the same blood. So how come you guys are giving those guys or those folks more resources, you should give the resources to us. Whereas the marriage migrants are saying, well, we're having your babies. You guys aren't having babies. We're the future of Korea. And so you see this contest between marginalized groups. And in the same way that sort of echoes what Judy's chapter was showing between the feminists and the LGBTQ activists, and again, I think this really speaks to these hierarchies. And so that's really getting into the weeds, but I think that's where the rubber hits the road in terms of trying to see the chapters in relationship to each other and how uh, um, 
potentially they might be mutually exclusive or they, or, or at least politically, they seem to be mutually exclusive. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, those are really important points, Aaron and, and Paul. And, and I'd add one more example when you were talking about youth um, versus the, the backlash against refugees is that it's actually the youth who are saying we're refugees. We can't even, we can't afford housing. Um, so it's interesting to see the contestations of rights and, and as much as we wanna say um, it shouldn't be seen as zero sum, um, we're seeing that that being played out as or perceived as zero sum and, and the hierarchies, the clinging to hierarchies, even among these groups um, is something to, to keep um, uh, watch, watch over. Can I just um, add, add one more example here? And um, you see it in the people with disabilities movement in um, which Jaewon added a chapter for a volume on this. And as they started to articulate um, rights claims as opposed to just being um, beneficiaries of medical care or social welfare benefits, um, they started to assert themselves as independent rights bearers is what um, Jaewon describes in his chapter. And in that process, you did have some clashes within the movement also about whether that would lead to a diminishing of the benefits that um, people with disabilities got from the state. Uh, but the rights uh, proponents, I guess, kind of won out in the end. And what they ended up doing was pushing for an, um, legislation to ban disability-based discrimination in order to become more legible as independent rights bearers to the state. Um, and so Aaron, to get to your point about over time, you know, if they might not have the rights currently, um, they pushed hard through protests and sit-ins and claims to the National Human Rights Commission um, and litigation in order to codify new rights for people with disabilities, in particular to um, combat dis disability-based discrimination. I, I think these are all great examples. Uh, we could probably have another session uh, to, to continue to continue this, but um, I think I, I think um, we've pretty much hit all the major questions and points. Um, I'll I'll hand it over maybe to Celeste or Chisu on on uh, what to look out for with um, the book and other events. Sure, thank you so much, and I, I also want to recognize and. Korea, it's getting quite late <laughs> with our time zone. So thank you for staying to the better end. Um, let me just offer uh, some more shameless self-promotion. Um, this book, as expensive as it is, hopefully you've taken advantage of the 20% discount code. Um, if you want uh, to save a, a little tiny bit of money, um, that was shared in the chat box. And then um, the ebook, and here it is shared again. Thank you, Jean. Um, the the ebook will be available in May, and then the hard copy finally, after all the blood, sweat, and tears that um, you all have contributed to it, uh, will be available in June. We think from Cambridge University Press, and we hope that this is um, uh, thought provoking and helpful volume. Um, we've certainly learned a lot and um, enjoyed the process of. Um, editing it and writing some parts of it. So um, I'll turn it over to Jisoo now. I don't have any you know, specific final comments to make, but to just thank um, our co-editors and um, all of our contributors and also two commentators for their very thoughtful comments, which really ignited discussion today. Uh, so thank you all. And thank you to all the participants who've uh, been with us uh, until the end. And if you have uh, you know, any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to any one of us and we'd be happy to um, answer. All right, thank you all. And uh, we'll see you all soon in person. <laughs>